joining us today. My name is Radu Magdin. I'm a Romanian analyst and consultant. I'm honored to be part of the Emerging Leaders Working Group, and I'll be your moderator today. This is a really important session. Despite the top agenda of, of the day, it's about stabilizing the Balkans. And we have some uh, impressive people with us today. I'll start uh, with the Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Slovakia, Mr. Miroslav Lajčak. He's also Foreign Minister and Minister for European Affairs. Deputy Prime Minister of Croatia, Mrs. Vesna Pusic, who is also Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, uh, Foreign and European Affairs. And Mrs. Bajanovic, who is Minister of Defense of Montenegro. What I propose is to start by a more general question, and then we'll be getting more into the debates and getting into the specifics. Uh, the big topic for us today is stabilizing the Balkans. And um, if you look at what's happening now in the world, different hotspots, different problems that we have both worldwide and in the region, sometimes these this aspects may seem overlooked. My question is for all three of you is, as a starter, how relevant do you think this still is both from the perspective of NATO and from the countries in the region. So how important is still NATO in terms of stabilizing the Balkans? Please, Mr. Lajczak. Well, we have uh, come a great deal uh, in the last 10, 15, 20 years in the Balkans, and there is, I see no need to stabilize the Balkans. The Balkans are stable, definitely in, uh, in military terms, in political terms. Uh, well, when speaking about stabilization of the Balkans, I think of uh, anchoring the region in the European Euro-Atlantic structures and bringing the, re the entire region into the NATO and the European Union. NATO's role in all this process has been crucial, of course. NATO brought peace, NATO man maintained peace in the region, but then gradually was able to hand over to the European Union. Uh, I think Bosnia-Herzegovina is a good example of uh, transfer of responsibilities first from NATO to EU and then from military to civilian. NATO's presence in Kosovo is no longer a substantial military action. It's rather you know, a mean, demonstration of commitment and stability. And now um, NATO and the Balkans are partners and uh, the countries of the region are part of our NATO's effort to stabilize the other parts of the world. Uh, such as Afghanistan, for example. So we are well on track. Uh, members, the, the front runners among the candidates. Yeah, the, the, the business has not been finished yet, but uh, definitely and luckily uh, the region is our partner. No, no longer a uh, reason for our concern or the object of our activities. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks for inviting me. Great to be here again. Uh, Two things, maybe. <clears throat> when Croatia entered the European Union, um, I saw a map of the Western Balkans that all of a sudden excluded Croatia. It all of a sudden was drawn so that Western Balkans, where Croatia was always counted as part of the Western Balkans, and it became the member of the European Union all of a sudden somebody drew the borders of the Western uh, Balkans on the eastern borders of Croatia. I think this is the first mistake or misperception that we have to correct. Uh, Western Balkans or the Balkans in general have for many different historical reasons, mostly deserved, but some I think also undeserved, have a um, bad reputation. And a number of countries from the Western Balkans, mine included, were fighting for a long time to prove that we were not the Balkans, we were Central Europe or something else, just not the Balkans. I think this has changed and has to change. And uh, our task is to change the image of the region as a region that contributes to stability, as a region that uh, actually is, is, if anything, uh, over-promoting regional cooperation at the moment, if that is possible, but certainly very intensely cooperating in the region. And also as a region that's not ex-Yugoslavia plus Albania, 
or ex-Yugoslavia minus the EU member states plus Albania. I think it's the countries of former Yugoslavia, meaning Slovenia and Croatia included, but also Bulgaria, Romania, Greece. It's our region and we have to take the responsibility for it. And maybe this is pol in political terms, the, the sort of most important change that took place. There are lots of problems. I think there is still a lot of unfinished business that we need to do. But one of the reasons, or let's say there are three reasons that I see for focusing on the Western Balkans in, in these uh, geographical terms that, that I defined. Um, one is that it's very dangerous to leave uh, these type of processes unfinished, thinking you know, it will go on of its own. It needs to be you know, watched and, and, and actively promoted and worked on. And the, uh, the other reason is that it's actually doable, unlike the other crisis spots that we are facing today. Uh, like uh, the Eastern Partnership and the countries and, and Ukraine and the Southern Partnership countries and, and uh, North Africa and Iraq. Uh, those things Europe has to be involved in, but it will certainly not solve them on their own. Needs the United States, needs cooperation probably with Russia, needs cooperation with the Arab states, a number of different countries. This Europe can actually do. So it's doable. And as especially uh, considering the, the hap what's happening in the neighborhood, the results, and the results is stabilizing these countries and, and uh, bringing them to a level where they can become members of the European Union and NATO is usable. It's useful and usable for the current EU member states and uh, NATO countries, because this is a region that in many ways is on the forefront um, in terms both to the southern and southeastern and eastern uh, neighborhood. Speaking of uh, the forefront, uh, Montenegro is right now in the forefront, and even though on the current summit agenda, uh, accession may not be an issue. It has been very enthusiastic on its way towards NATO. And you have, Mrs. Spanovich, you have a lot of experience in your national politics, and you have also been ambassador abroad. My question to you is more likely related to winning hearts and minds, and how do you manage expectations? Because uh, I know as a Romanian, because we had expectations as well on our path towards NATO and the EU. How do you manage expectations at home, and how do you keep these expectations up so that you manage further, uh, further accelerate the process? Well, you are right, we are there and uh, we do believe that uh, there are all uh, circumstances and preconditions that will work in our favor and then uh, by the next summit uh, we will uh, be in a different position. Of course, we are not dealing that much with the expectations, we are much more dealing with uh, what we've got to do and uh, there are actually uh, we, I think, uh, did a lot showing that uh, this country, which is a tiny country in uh, Western Balkans, could be and um, was actually a kind of example how efficiently uh, all necessary reforms could be first adopted and then implemented. And I think that it's uh, one very big advantage of Montenegro. I remember the times when we were fighting for our independence and uh, Mr. Leitchak was part of that. I was in Brussels at the time. And the, one of the arguments that was um, uh, very often used was the argument like, oh, why would you be willing uh, to have your own state when you are so small and there is no logic in this and so on and so forth. And uh, our counter-argument was that the size doesn't matter. And I think that the size really in this regard doesn't matter because Montenegro is having a kind of a position in the region which is uh, 
not in a direct correlation which uh, watches the surface or a number of population in this case. Because we showed in these turbulent 90s that uh, we do have that uh, democratic capacity and enough of a tolerance to avoid all the atrocities that were around and try to uh, showcase uh, how all these differences we are having uh, could uh, work in our favor. Uh, that's uh, how I do believe that the whole uh, region of Western Balkans in this dimension we've been talking about is a kind of a crossroad of these different cultures, religions and civilizations and uh, we should be responsible enough uh, to use that for our uh, further progress and uh, that is our responsibility to show how this uh, could be done in an effective manner and therefore uh, Montenegro is showing that every day. Uh, and I really believed that uh, before this sum summit we would have been in a position to be better assessed and uh, despite all the uh, challenges that are present around when it comes to the global movements and changes, I do believe that uh, when you are looking at this map in Western Balkans and when you are thinking about integrations as a tool for stabilizing it, that this was the right time to go further with the issuing invitation to Montenegro and to, in um, uh, some sense, uh, fill up this hole which is there at the Adriatic coast. Because uh, when you look all the Mediterranean and when you look on the European part of the Mediterranean basin, then you've got just one hole. And that is the part of the Adriatic coast which belongs to Montenegro. There is no reason not to fill up uh, this part of the coast and to have a, uh, this uh, cohesion there which is, I think, needed in these times of turbulence. So. Uh, we will uh, keep on um, doing what is necessary. We will keep on showing that uh, we are really at the level which guarantees that we could be a reliable partner, not only in this program of partnership for peace or a step further, but as, as a full member. And we already show that uh, we are able to contribute to the global peace and security. And I do believe for the region that actually there are those three dimensions which are very important for stabilizing it. It's security, it's political environment, and it's economical environment. The security one is already progressed a lot. And there we are all showing a high level of awareness and capabilities and capacities to go further on to export it into the other parts of the world where it is needed. We are having very effective cooperation between us. Say, for example, we are having those regional initiatives where we are together participating in ISAF mission in uh, Afghanistan. And I'm very proud of the fact that uh, after participating there with the Hungary, we are now with Croatia. And that is something which I think it's a very clear sign how long road we all passed in the last few years and how now we can uh, really cooperate in an effective manner. Further on, I do believe that um, economically we should focus a little bit more on uh, what is our mutual cooperation. First, initiatives are already taken and we all believe that uh, it will contribute a lot into changing the environment and go further on and showing actually that we do uh, substantially belong to what is this vision of Europe as a whole and free. Thank you. Um, clearly, it's first of all in terms of NATO accession and stabilize. It's an issue first of reforms, so substance. But you mentioned something very interesting: the idea of branding and how it's important to rebrand the region. And I was wondering, in terms of bilateral cooperation or <coughs> multilateral cooperation in the area, how much have there been discussions up to now, or if if you think that it's the right moment to start building brand Balkans? I think that. I would say everybody agrees on that. The question is, how do you go about it? Um, there was an attempt, actually, more than 10 years ago, by the that time Greek foreign minister, right before Greece took over the pre presidency at that time uh, of the European Union, who called together a group, maybe one of the best groups of people I've ever been uh, met with a group of people from the countries of the region. Unfortunately, we had a fantastic two days of debates in, in a Greek resort, but we didn't, took it any, we didn't take it any further. However, 
the, the idea was there, that there is some, um, and now maybe the, the, the circumstances have changed and uh, this is much less of an elitist idea where you can have three, four people from each country which are great and graduated from you know, I don't know what university, but there is more an awareness in the societies of the region that um, the dangers of not cooperating, the dangers of not identifying the comparative advantages that you have, the dangers of <clears throat> not using up your potentials are for us great and we pay dearly for that. And uh, so it's a much more widespread idea, uh, a much more widespread and much more accepted idea. The question of cooperation is not even a question anymore. I mean, people travel back and forth, work together and everything. We meet all the time. The question is maybe of um, finding the most effective ways of institution building and sort of sustainable, um, how can I say, sustainable levels of progress. Uh, not to have a great thing happen and then after that everybody, you know, every, everything uh, sort of, uh, how do you say that, goes, goes you know, lo loses the momentum and, and somehow loses that, that motivation. This is something that, that I think is the key issue in the region. There are people, there's absolute awareness that it's our responsibility and we need a new image. We need a, a positive image and we have the capacity to have a positive, positive image with all the, the problems. I, I think we can do that. Uh, the question is the exact strategies and techniques of going about this. Who takes the lead probably as well? Uh, I think whoever thinks of something useful takes the lead. <laughs> and this is, this is also uh, a sign of progress because you know, if Montenegro comes up with something useful in cultural cooperation or in economic cooperation, we are perfectly happy to take it up and follow. If we come up with you know, something or whoever comes up with something that's seen as useful and, and, and can contribute, I think people feel pretty relaxed about this. It's not like, you know, if it's not us, we are not going to <laughs> take part in this. I'll ask Mrs. Bianovic if you have any, any thoughts about this, about the issue of branding. Something else to add to what you Yeah, I agree with the fact that uh, we have passed a great deal on that road. And I remember that time when we started it and uh, it was um, stability pact for Southeastern Europe. Uh, that was the time when we were rebuilding the bridges among us. And despite the fact that um, we expected more in the sense of the real cooperation and the projects, we've got to be aware that uh, it was useful anyway, because uh, uh, we found the way how to again uh, first talk among ourselves mm -hmm. and then to start some kind of a real cooperation. Uh, in the meantime, uh, when it comes to cooperation among the countries, I think that uh, Montenegro is again in a kind of uh, advantage position because uh, we practically do not have any open questions around or if there are some we are resolving them in a democratic manner. So uh, we tried always to be a kind of uh, bridge where everyone could meet and where we could start some uh, uh, new initiatives and there has been a number of them and uh, I agree that we've got to structure that a little bit and say what we've been doing lately when it comes to the sector of defense, uh, there is a number of those different forums, different uh, initiatives, different programs. So from the last year, we are trying to uh, find a way how we put all that together, how we could uh, find uh, the means and the methods to uh, work more effectively and that's why we are now rethinking all these different uh, fora, all these different initiatives, trying to put that all under one umbrella and then to work out what are the specific and uh, 
uh, the completely concrete programs where we can work uh, uh, together and we already identified a number of them having the first results and I believe that something like that could be done in other areas. It's, uh, it's uh, simply somehow we are at this stage of maturity where we all do feel some kind of responsibility to pass to the next level uh, from establishing the bridge, talking, uh, better understanding, okay, now we've got to deliver something. And I think that we are on that stage. And I believe that actually also since um, all of us, when it comes to European integrations, are on the same level of understanding and having that as a strategic priority, rest of us, I mean, who are not already there, that uh, we could use that platform for something which will be connected us much better and which will, uh, in a sense, uh, not help us because um, I believe we've got to do that uh, uh, by ourselves, but still be uh, some kind of facilitator in trying to find the right ways and means. Thank you. Before going to questions from the audience, I would have just a small question uh, for Mr. Lajcha because we're speaking a lot the, the past few days about geopolitics and how, it's, how much it matters lately. And uh, I propose we come back for a minute to the 90s and the fact that Slovakia was uh, initiated together with, with Hungary, the Czech Republic and Poland, Visegrad. And now what we're seeing in the Union is what we call Visegrad Plus. And I was wondering, looking at this experience, do you see in the future the region of the Balkans trying to have its own Visegrad or trying directly at a certain moment in time based on reforms to have something like join and have something like Visegrad plus plus? <laughs> Visegrad is a regional group of Central European countries. The, the Balkan is a different region. They need regional cooperation and I'm really pleased to see that there is an overall understanding of this, of this fact that uh, but the Balkans are rebranding themselves in the most positive way. I, I was suspicious some years back that uh, for some countries of the region, integration means to get an advantage vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors, to use for settling their un, uh, open accounts. Uh, but this is definitely over. Uh, and uh, the, they are working together. My two recommendations are, well, focus on infrastructure, because it's badly needed, and integration. So don't create structures that would detract you from uh, what, the prior, what is your priority, which is the EU and NATO. So whatever you do uh, as a region, whichever structures you set, compare them to what extent they are bringing you closer uh, to the European Union and NATO. So that's important. And uh, as it was said by both ladies here, it's not about the number of initiatives because I, I'm f lost in uh, how many regional initiatives there are related to Black Sea, for example, <laughs> and what, what they do. So it's really to focus on, on issues of political integration, economic cooperation, in infrastructure. And, and this is happening. So uh, we, uh, well, Visegrad 4 was extremely helpful for us. And so was SEFTA uh, in, in the economic area. So, uh, and we are telling our friends in the Balkans, we don't have to, uh, well, to, to copy get everything we do, but learn from us. I mean, uh, repeat what has worked with us and avoid what has, has not. So the, that's easy. Thank you. If you have any questions, please. Please. We'll take both questions and then I propose a reply. Please. Thank you very please much. Please introduce yourselves. My name is uh, Vasile Rotaro. I am from Moldova. Uh, we can notice that after 2000, uh, every EU new member became first NATO member and then EU member. It's kind of unwritten rule. So I was wondering, from your opinion, if any country from Western Balkans or <coughs> Eastern Partnership could become EU member without becoming a NATO member. For instance, Moldova is a neutral country. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. I mean, look at Serbia. Uh, Serbia has not declared its intention to join NATO, and this is widely accepted, and Serbia is now an EU candidate country. And uh, yeah, it's, it has become a pattern, but it's not a rule. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in your case, again, everybody understands the uh, specific position of the Republic of Moldova and your constitutionally declared neutrality, and I don't see this an, as any disadvantage when it comes to your uh, rapprochement and future integration with the European Union. We have a colleague. Hello, I'm uh, Harvey Čuric Hrvatinic, I'm Croatian Foreign Office. I would like to ask a question for the Deputy Prime Minister Pusic, but also I would enjoy insight from the other guests as well, just to see the perspective. 
If you could uh, single out a problem that should be addressed before others if the Balkans region should, would uh, prosper or evolve in the proper way, what would it be? And also, what do you see as a perfect mechanism or the vehicle for solving that problem? Thank you. I think it's actually the, the show of progress that today we can say it's the economy. Uh, because it was, for years, it was politics, uh, history, uh, war wounds, uh, the missing, um, you know, who apologizes to whom, uh, how can you rebuild any kind of communication, and it wasn't fake. You know, people sometimes even at that time were saying, ah, you should focus on the economy, who cares about these things? It's not true. You actually have to deal with these things. It's important to deal with these things because they can overrule one of the big issues, big problems that we have is uh, being able to articulate what our interests are. Because very often people make decisions based on things that are not in their interest, but they're so, so emotionally loaded that you know, they overall the interest. But I think that today we have reached a level where singling out economy and profitable cooperation for all of us in the region and using that as, as an advantage is maybe the key thing that, that we have to address. Two points I'd like to make. First, yes, it's the economy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, still, in Central Europe, it's the economy that dictates the politics. Uh, the politicians cannot behave in a way that he, will, he or she will uh, endanger economic interests of, of, of his country, which is how it should be. We are, we are not there yet with all the countries of the region. When uh, people tell me, why don't we address the economic situation in Bosnia-Herzegovina and through economy will fix the political uh, architecture? I said, no, it won't work. You, you need to have a structure for that first. So uh, economy is important, but uh, we need to have the necessary, as I said, structures and ar architecture. And my second point is, well, there are two countries I'm still worried about, uh, uh, not from the security perspective, but from the, the future perspective, which is Bosnia-Herzegovina and uh, Macedonia, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, as you wish. Uh, and uh, because there has not been the, the breaking point uh, when they demonstrated the political will, yes, this is our priority and we are going to act accordingly. Well, they keep saying that this is their priority, but uh, in fact you see that the priority is something else. I think the region has matured enough now to take lead in to dealing with these two countries, talking to them, because you are neighbors, you are authentic, uh, they, you, you play no games, uh, it's the, for the interest of the stability of the region, and rather than to have uh, envoys coming from all over the world, or different initiatives, which uh, are which have one thing in common, namely that they understand nothing about the local situation and mentality and psychology. Maybe, uh, I, I really believe that the situation is already mature enough for you to, to, to take over the lead and initiative in dealing with these two, two problems. So sure, I'll join to what um, my colleagues already said. It's um, very much about economy, where the conditions are set for the economy to uh, have this kind of a priority position. And uh, somehow I do believe that uh, in that direction, um, still we are talking about the integration processes as something which is creating the conditions for going forward. And uh, just uh, what um, Mr. Lajčak mentioned, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and FIROM, uh, are kind of uh, those two points where we are having certain concerns. But again, we could come to the point where we can use both of them as an example how the fact that um, you are, in a sense, uh, slowing down this integration process can have uh, the effects which are, which are the reversible one. 
and that is how we've got to uh, link all what we are talking about and of course having us as a region in a leading role we've got to have some kind of incentives which are coming from Brussels and we've got this process which is uh, like in the case which was uh, among uh, Belgrade in Pristina. We were all aware that it should be resolved. We were offering our help. We were ready to talk with all of them, but then it was resolved successfully as it has been. So I just think that uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, just put away this uh, uh, point as something which uh, still could be helpful and at certain points where we do need to create a little bit better environment. I'd like to thank you very much. The ministers have to be at the summit and we have to go to lunch. So <laughs> oh, thank you all. So it's better <laughs> for Some food for thought now. Yeah? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'll walk here.